Hi everyone, uh, I'm Taco Cohen, uh, and I'm going to be talking today about omnidirectional CNNs and more generally uh, equivariant neural nets and uh, convolutional nets on manifolds. So the outline for today is uh, as follows. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about the general concepts of equivariance and symmetry, uh, which are fundamental to much of this work. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about rotation equivariant CNNs on the plane. Uh, which will help understand the generalization to spherical images. Uh, then I'll talk about spherical CNNs, convolutional networks that operate directly on uh, spherical images or other kinds of signals on the sphere. Uh, and then uh, finally, I'll talk about gauge CNNs, which is a, a class of methods uh, and a mathematical theory for how to build convolutional networks on general manifolds. Uh, and I'll have a number of specific examples. The icosahedron is probably the most interesting for omnidirectional vision because it leads to a very, very efficient uh, algorithm. Uh, we also have mesh CNNs, which can be applied to arbitrary uh, uh, you know, meshes in, um, uh, in three dimensions. Uh, and a recent work on the spherical gauge CNN, the faster spherical CNN, as well as natural graph CNNs. Uh, all right, so the, the concept of uh, symmetry uh, is, uh, is a very general one in, in mathematics. Uh, it's defined as follows, a transformation of an object that leaves the object invariant. Now, we can all visualize uh, these geometric objects as pictured here and what, uh, imagine what their symmetries are. Uh, but in machine learning, we're interested in more abstract symmetries, namely symmetries of a learning problem. So for example, in object recognition, we know that if we shift an image, uh, the identity of the object does not change. Or similarly, if we have a spherical image and we rotate that uh, image, uh, then the identity of the object does change. And so we say this is a symmetry of the label function, or in other words, a symmetry of the learning problem. And those are the symmetries that we want to exploit in order to get better uh, statistical efficiency, to ease learning, to help the network automatically understand that these rotated objects or translated objects are really the same thing without requiring uh, uh, learning for that. So this provides uh, what I, I think of as a design principle uh, for neural network architectures. Whenever you're faced with a new problem, the first question to ask is, what are the symmetry transformations? And secondly, how can I build a network that's equivariant to those symmetries, i.e. respects those symmetries? So there are many examples in the literature. For example, a standard convolutional network is equivariant to translations. So it respects translation symmetries, or more concretely, if I shift the input image and then apply a number of layers of convolutions, the resulting feature maps will also undergo a shift. That's, the, uh, that's what we mean by equivariance. And you can generalize this, uh, although convolutional nets are not equivariant to rotations, you can make them uh, equivariant to rotations and, and translations simultaneously with something that we call uh, GCNNs or group convolution, uh, group convolutional neural nets. Other popular methods like graph neural nets uh, are also adhering to this, uh, this principle in that they respect the permutation symmetry, which is relevant in that domain. And we now have a general theory for how to do this on general signals on homogeneous spaces. The sphere is just one example of such a homogeneous space and even on uh, general manifolds where a uh, special kind of symmetry called gauge symmetry starts to play a role. All right, so first a little bit about uh, rotation equivariant planar CNNs. So uh, here I'm going to show what uh, a group convolutional network does uh, for a very simple group, namely discrete translations and rotations by multiples of 90 degrees. So we have on the top left uh, an image of an F and we're going to apply the first layer of group convolution, which works as follows. Let's say we have a single filter. Uh, just like in a normal convolution, we would slide it over the image, compute dot products everywhere, and produce a feature map like this. Now, in addition, in group convolution, we apply other symmetries in our group. In addition to translations, we apply a 90-degree rotation. Combined with all rotations, uh, we obtain another feature map. And we do this four times like this, uh, and that's very simply the group convolution for rotations and translations. Now, the interesting thing is that if we rotate the input, we see that the feature maps uh, also transform. And more specifically, what happens is that uh, clearly each of the feature maps 
is rotated. But in addition, what used to be a vertical structure in the image becomes a horizontal structure. And so it becomes, it, it, it will be picked up by the horizontally oriented filter. So the transformation law for the feature space is that the channels rotate, the orientation channels rotate, and there's a cyclic shift among the channels. And so in the second and higher layers of this network, uh, we have a filter which now has four input orientation channels. And we apply the same principle. We convolve this filter with the input feature map. Uh, and then we rotate it, convolve again, etc. cetera. Uh, but now rotation of this, uh, this uh, filter means rotate each of the channels and cyclically permute the channels. And one can show that if you do this, then the network uh, maintains its equivariance property. And then at the end, you could do an invariant pooling to obtain, uh, say, for example, a segmentation uh, output, which transforms just like the input image. So you can do this in 3D. And what happens is that in 3D, you have a lot more symmetries, even if you just consider discrete rotations. And so now you have a lot more weight sharing. And the instead of the channels just cycling, they will undergo a complicated permutation uh, that can be read, read out from this, uh, this diagram. So the main message here is that in a GCNN, uh, you will have along the feature dimension, you can think of those channels as orientation channels. They correspond to different orientations of the filter. And when you apply a transformation in the feature space, you have to do this, uh, this uh, transformation on the, on the channels as well. Mathematically speaking, uh, you can think of the uh, feature dimension as a function on the group of, for example, rotations. Um, if you want to try this out, you can. Uh, there's now pretty uh, good code out there. There's uh, E2CNN, which can do this for continuous rotations in the plane, as pictured here. Normal CNN, which is not equivariant. The feature maps are undergoing uh, weird changes, detecting different features in different orientations. Uh, as you can see, especially in the stabilized view, whereas the GCNN can do this, uh, uh, well, the feature maps just undergo a rotation. Uh, the same for 3D and my old code for doing this for discrete groups, which is uh, uh, probably the simplest to use, but also uh, yeah, limited to discrete groups. All right, spherical CNNs. So the idea of spherical CNNs can easily be understood by analogy to planar CNNs. So a planar convolution can be understood as follows. We say that the output feature map at a certain position x in Z2, that's the integer coordinate, uh, is computed as an inner product between the input feature map and a filter that was shifted by X. So X plays the role of positions, but also of, of translations. And by analogy, a spherical convolution, uh, we just swap out the symmetry group of translations for three-dimensional rotations. And we say that the output feature map uh, at a certain rotation R in the group of rotations called SO3, is computed as an inner product between the input feature map and a filter rotated by R. So the key thing is, just like in the slides before, now the output feature maps are indexed both by, uh, not just by position on the sphere, but by a general rotation in the group. So whereas in the planar case, we convolve planar image with a planar filter, we get a planar output. Here we have a spherical input signal, say a spherical image, and a spherical filter, and the output is a function on SO3. So a simple way to think about that is that you have just a bunch of spherical maps, and at each position on the sphere, uh, you get a number of responses that correspond to different orientations of the same filter. So in the second and higher layers, uh, you can use a SO3 convolution, which takes two of such signals, uh, uh, an input feature map and a filter, and produces an output feature map in an equivariant manner. So the equivariance is depicted here. If we take this, uh, this dummy uh, image as input, as a, a map of the, uh, of the Earth, we can rotate it, for example, around the z-axis, which in this uh, planar projection corresponds to a cyclic shift along the x-axis, or along, say, the y-axis, uh, and that leads to a severe distortion in this projection where the the south pole over here is this, it's a strip, and after rotation, it's a, it's a blob. So no way that a planar CNN applied to this projection would recognize those as the same thing, 
but to a spherical CNN, these are just the same thing. No matter what weights you learn, it will always generate an equivalent output, which is shown by this diagram. If you convolve and then rotate the feature maps, you get the same thing as rotating the input and then convolving. Uh, so we applied this to a number of problems, for example, 3D object recognition, where you take a 3D uh, object and you basically raycast from every point on the sphere to the center, register the distance and generate a bunch of other uh, feature maps. This is a lossy representation. It doesn't capture all the information about the shape, but nevertheless, uh, we showed it with spherical CNNs. Uh, you can do quite well in, in classifying these, uh, these objects. Uh, and moreover, it automatically generalizes to arbitrary rotations. So this is uh, from 2018, and there are a number of limitations uh, to this work. Uh, so first of all, the, the spherical convolution is implemented via uh, a rather complicated uh, thing called a non-commutative fast Fourier transform, which should be fast in theory, especially if you have uh, large filters, but is somewhat slow and memory intensive and complicated in practice. Uh, and the pixel grid is also not ideal. You have the fact that the number of filter orientation has to scale with the spatial resolution, which is a bad property. And moreover, it only makes sense for perfect spheres. So if you have an omnidirectional image um, that isn't really on a sphere, uh, then this doesn't actually make sense. You need a convolutional net on a manifold. Fisheye uh, images, uh, same thing. So let, let's talk about that. Uh, so how can we generalize convolution to arbitrary manifolds so that we can take the power of convolutional nets and uh, bring them to bear on these kinds of problems? Problems in omnidirectional imaging, but also many scientific domains uh, and uh, medical domains and such. So the basic idea uh, with convolution is that we put a filter somewhere at an origin in some orientation, say aligned with this uh, black arrow, and then uh, we would shift the filter over the the shape over the manifold and compute a dot product at every position. That's how we often think of convolution. Now the trouble with curved manifolds is that the path along which you shift the filter will have an effect on the orientation of the filter at the endpoint. So if you take our arrow here or imagine a filter over here and if we shift it along this curve where the blue arrows are, we end up at the opposite side with a blue arrow pointing this way. Whereas if we follow the red arrows, we end up with a filter or an arrow pointing exactly the opposite direction. And this is a very fundamental problem. This is not something you can just uh, get rid of by a clever choice of paths or anything like that. This is a very fundamental thing uh, that we cannot uh, evade. So what's the solution? Well, there are methods that uh, deal with this. Uh, in fact, one of the first methods in geometric deep learning uh, had a solution. Uh, here the idea with, is to extract at each position P in your manifold, a local patch, so a local piece of signal or image uh, uh, on your manifold. And then you take inner products with rotated copies of the same filter. And then you just max pull over these orientations to get a response that's invariant to or independent of how the filter was oriented. Now, this is a good approach, but of course it's, it's limiting because now the re final response after max pooling can tell you that, for example, there is an edge at this location, but it cannot tell you what orientation the edge has. And so if in the next layer you want to detect, say, an extended contour, uh, you can't tell anymore whether the edge segments are aligned or not, which is uh, limiting. So we have a solution that we call gauge equivariant CNNs. It's actually a very general framework, but I'll, uh, I'll try to keep it uh, fairly specific uh, in this talk. So what we do is, uh, like in the geodesic CNN, we pick an arbitrary frame or gauge, as it's called in, in physics, a gauge theory. Uh, and we, do, we have a different frame at each position in the manifold as depicted uh, here. So the red frames, for example, or the blue frames, they're different choices of gauge. And then we position the filter in a fixed manner relative to this frame. In other words, we pick an arbitrary orientation for the filter. And then again, like in uh, geodesic CNNs, we apply the filter in every orientation, uh, and also similar to what we did in the, the planar GCNN. Or more generally, you can use steerable filters. If you're interested, look at our paper on steerable CNNs. Um, and then uh, there's a, a tricky part. 
uh, we're not going to do max pooling. And so we end up with geometric features, features that have some orientation information. And so when the input contains these oriented or non-scalar features, which we'll have in layers two and, and higher, uh, we need to take into account the gauge uh, uh, when interpreting those coefficients. So basically what we do is we parallel transport the nearby geometric feature vectors to the center of the kernel before applying a learned map. Because if you have these two nearby feature vectors, but they have a very different uh, frame, then uh, you cannot just interpret those numbers in the same way and apply the same linear map to them. So that's the theory. Uh, you can implement this in practice, and that's still uh, an active area of research. Uh, here is one algorithm for doing this on a particular uh, shape called the icosahedron, which is a good approximation to the sphere and which leads to a very fast uh, and efficient scalable algorithm. Uh, so here the idea is you first uh, apply a, you put a, um, uh, a nice symmetrical grid on the icosahedron shown here. Pixels are at the intersections of the edges. Uh, you project your signal to this, uh, to this grid. That introduces some slight distortion, but it's fairly minimal. Uh, we then carve up this space into a number of charts. They overlap at the, at the borders. And uh, we can, we can, it's not pictured here, but for each gauge, uh, we have a frame. It's uh, like this. It has one arrow pointing in the diagonal, uh, you know, up and to the left, and one arrow pointing to the right. Uh, now that's a, that's a gauge represented inside of this chart. And so the meaning on the actual icosahedron can be different. For example, this green edge here corresponds to this green edge here. So when we transition between these two charts, we need to apply a plus one or two pi over six uh, rotation to our features. So that's the, the charting. What we do is we apply a shear transformation to turn this hexagonal grid into a square grid. And then we can set, uh, represent our signal as like this in a rectangular image with some padding in between the charts. These are very low res charts, but you can do this for any resolution. Now, the algorithm of the gauge equivariant convolution uh, basically consists of uh, a few steps. Uh, first, we do padding. So in between these, uh, in these padding regions, we copy uh, pixels from other regions, applying an appropriate gauge transformation as needed. It's a very cheap operation. That gives us a sort of a dense picture like this with some redundancies. Some pixels appear multiple times when they're in this padding region. Uh, then the second step is to take our filters, either say a scalar filter or a filter with multiple uh, input orientation channels. And we apply something called uh, filter expansion. We rotate the filter, either just rotating it like this in the scalar case or rotating with cyclic shifts like this. That gives us a filter bank, which we can now just give as input to conv2d along with our padded uh, feature maps and just apply simple conv2d uh, in order to compute the convolution on this, uh, this manifold. So that's, that, that's really what does all the heavy lifting. And of course, this is heavily optimized. And so uh, uh, this algorithm is very fast. Well, we tested this on various problems, including uh, pa climate pattern segmentation, where we got state-of-the-art results, and also omnidirectional image segmentation, where we also got, I think, state-of-the-art uh, back, uh, back last year. Uh, so recently, we've been extending this to more general shapes. So for example, uh, general meshes, uh, we have a, a mesh CNN, which you can already find on, on archive over here. Uh, this is basically a minimal modification of a graph convolutional net in order to take into account not just the topological structure of the graph, but also the geometry, so the positions and angles of the, of the, between the nodes and, and the edges. And then we also have a new method for uh, spherical CNNs, which unlike the icosahedral CNN does not introduce distortion. And unlike the earlier spherical CNN is not, uh, does not use a Fourier transform, but a, a quadrature integration to get numerically precise uh, results in an efficient manner. And finally, a short plug about something we're very excited about right now, which is called natural graph networks that uh, will appear in archive uh, soon as well. So here the idea is to do to generalize graph networks, again, thinking about the symmetries or local symmetries, gauge symmetries, if you will, on a graph uh, in order to uh, improve uh, uh, graph networks. All right, and that's it. Thank you for your attention.